thanks, thanks for inviting us up here. Um, first off, I'd like to introduce uh, Nisar Ahmed, who's our uh, Assistant Food and Beverage Director. And of course, most of you know uh, Suzanne, um, who's been a great help this morning. Uh, Stan Taggart is my AM sous chef, and uh, <laughs> Stephen Paul Ellis is my PM sous chef. So um, these three guys here are the ones that, uh, well, I make all the promises and they make it happen. <laughs> it's kind of how it works. And then we've got a couple other uh, dignitaries with us this morning that made the trek with us. Uh, we've got Justin Nabel and Ty Tyler Arnelius. Uh, they both work in, uh, in the kitchen with us also, and they came up for support. But anyway, now you know who the one, two, three, four, five, six culprits are from Broken Top. Um, I can speak for myself, and I think uh, the rest of the staff feels the same way. We're very proud to work up at Broken Top. Uh, they support uh, excellence in culinary and in food and beverage service. Um, a little bit about the Culinary Olympics. I've been involved in the uh, Culinary Olympics since uh, 1986 uh, when I was in central Illinois at a uh, club there called the Country Club of Decatur. Uh, I mentored an apprentice who went on to uh, help uh, Team Finland that year. And then in 1990, I uh, also mentored another apprentice who went on to help Team USA. And then when I moved out here to Oregon, I worked in the Valley in Salem at uh, Illahee Hills Country Club and another apprentice who made the, uh, the junior team. And we'll see some uh, pictures of the junior team as, as we move on here. Uh, but a little bit about the Olympics. Um, this go round, uh, 52 countries participated, over 1,600 chefs from uh, throughout the United States. Uh, converged on this town of Erfurt, Germany, which is uh, four hours, as they say in Europe, motor coach ride uh, from Frank Frankfurt. We call it a bus. Um, but anyway, um, it's in the what they call the Thuringian territory. And what they're known for there is their agriculture and their green thumb. Uh, so I guess I want to say just a bounty of uh, good eats there to be had. Uh, the reason they chose this town, it's been in Munich and in Frankfurt uh, many, many times. The first Culinary Olympics was in 1905. Um, it turned out to be, uh, the first one turned out to be kind of what we would know at the state fair, is uh, who has the best uh, cake, pickles, so on and so forth. And then it grew and evolved and evolved and evolved. Uh, pretty, uh, pretty soon different countries were coming, participating in it. And then it became uh, uh, pretty cutthroat with the, uh, the chefs from different countries coming uh, to compete. And it has evolved into what it is now today. But anyway, Erfurt built this uh, structure known as the Messe, is what they call it. We know it as a convention center. And I've got a couple of pictures of it here uh, in the slideshow presentation. But without further ado, let's get to the pictures and... Um, uh, well, but, well, excuse me, before we do that, uh, what Suzanne and Paul and Stan are working on here is uh, we're going to feed you guys today. Uh, the, we're going to do three small tasting courses um, to give you an idea of uh, our style of cuisine. We like to uh, classify it as classical in uh, preparation in uh, contemporary plating styles. And if anybody's ever been up to Broken Top uh, and seen our china, uh, I picked china that came from England. We've got diamond shapes, we've got fluted bowls, we've got squares, we've got uh, rectangles, we've got uh, bent curved plates. Um, and for me, that, that's, a, uh, that's a big leap because I'm a pretty traditional uh, round plate uh, type of guy, but not for the last, oh, I want to say about nine years now. Um, I've been using that particular china for, for quite a while, but the reason I bring that up is the contemporary plating technique, um, in my opinion, is now more important in uh, food service and culinary than uh, it ever has been. Um, so you watch a TV food network and all this stuff you see, and we'll see uh, food plated on uh, marble and granite, 
uh, glass, all different kinds of um, vessels used to plate food. So you'll see what I'm talking about. But the first course we're doing here today is we've got a little um, sautéed spinach um, on the bottom. Then we've got a warm chanterelle salad uh, on top of that. And then finally, well, then we've got uh, duck prosciutto, house-made duck prosciutto, and then some crispy onions on that. Um, this duck prosciutto was cured for two days in uh, pomegranate syrup uh, and sugar and peppercorns and salt. And what, there are bay leaves in there too, guys. It's pretty straightforward, simple, simple recipe. Uh, what we did is we took the duck breast, put them in a two-inch hotel pan, or uh, what is that, a 12 by 20 pan. Uh, put our uh, juice, our liquid in there, or put the ducks in there, put another two inch pan on top of that and weighted it down with number 10 cans. And then we let that sit for a day. Then we flipped it on the other side, did the same thing. Then we took those duck breasts out of there and then we cold smoked them for an hour. And uh, I got a question here. What's cold smoke mean? Do you guys know what that means? Yeah. Less than what? Um, okay, we cold smoke these from 80 to 90 degrees for an hour. Okay, and then when you smoke smoke or hot smoke something, what is it, 130 to 180, something like that? Because I know that uh, temperature is a real important culinary art. So anyway, um, if you wouldn't mind, if we could start with the back row, come on up and get something when the back row is done, and then just keep on going, and this will uh, kind of get your taste buds going while I. Uh, walk you through the slideshow and then uh, Nisar has got a, uh, a presentation on wine service and some suggested wines that uh, would go with what we're serving. So, so your first course is uh, duck prosciutto with a warm chanterelle salad uh, and sautéed spinach. Oh yeah, and uh, to provide uh, a bit of crunch on here that we've got the onions on there but also we've got some pine nuts in that chanterelle salad too. So if you think about the ingredients in this, um, I, I guess in my world it gets about as earthy as it can get. You know, spinach is really earthy, mushrooms are of the earth, uh, and then uh, of course the duck there. So um, a couple other things about this. That's why we put the, the pomegranate in there to kind of maybe uh, give it a different dimension, a different element to that earthiness. And then of course, uh, you know, I believe in sweet and sour, uh, smooth and uh, uh, crunchy, and I try to do that in, in most of the dishes that we do. Uh, let's see, what else, what else, what else? Oh, on this duck, you'll notice that we didn't trim any of the fat off. Uh, traditionally, prosciutto is a pretty, uh, I guess, fatty uh, meat. And what you'll find, uh, the oil uh, from the fat really picks up that pomegranate and that smoke, just incredible. So we think we've got a, a really, really, really good balance of flavors here. So I hope you guys enjoy that. And uh, by the way, <clears throat> this is on, uh, this is an appetizer on our dinner menu up there also. So uh, what do you guys think of that? Did you, do you like it? I mean, is it it's good? I'm not fishing for compliments here. <laughs> But I know it's good, because I've eaten a few orders of it myself, as you can probably tell. But anyway, duck is truly, truly one of my favorite things. In uh, last year, we did a duck pastrami. So it's, it's very versatile. OK, here we go. Um, on my way to Germany, uh, because I'm such a, a foodie guy and enjoy uh, different markets and uh, different cultures and things like that, I was talking to a, a gentleman uh, before I left on my trip, and he says, uh, so what's your flight plan, blah, 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 and I told him, and uh, he, I told him I had a seven hour layover in San Francisco. And he said, well, you should go to the ferry market down in the Embarcadero region there. It's really uh, interesting, and you're a food guy, and you'll like it and all that. And I told him, sure, I'll go. Well, here I, I get to the airport, and I'm all uh, ready for my trip to Germany. I'm really comfortable in the airport. But a half hour passed, and I said, you know what? This is too boring for me. I'm going to get out of my comfort zone. So I jumped on the BART, which goes uh, right into uh, the airport, the Bay Area Rapid Transit. Took me right down to Embarcadero. I came uh, 
up from the BART onto the street level, and I said, hey, where's the ferry building at? The guy said, that way, five minutes, and I'm so glad I did that. Uh, this first slide is the ferry building. If you've ever been to San Francisco, this looks really uh, familiar to you, and I literally stumbled across this uh, because I wasn't going to do this. Um, but once I got into the building, this is some of the stuff that I started to see. I was just like flabbergasted. Um, the left, there's salami and bacon drying in the curing cabinet. Uh, the slabs above the salamis there, those are slabs of bacon. Uh, to the right was a gluten-free pastry shop um, that I found there, which was really interesting. Uh, then uh, we moved, oh, about five feet to my left to one of my favorite things in the world, uh, mushrooms. And on the right there it says, I was thinking, is this what they meant by heaven on earth? Because I'm such a mushroom guy, I was just blown away by this. Those hedgehogs, look at the size of those. Uh, the, the top center, uh, those were uh, cremimis under glass. Now, I worked at a, a private club in South, uh, South Carolina, uh, just outside of uh, Augusta, Georgia, where they do the masters. And I used to have a, a purveyor come in with shiitake mushrooms every week, nonstop. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't understand where this lady was coming up with all these shiitakes. And she had a, uh, a farm where she took logs and injected them with something and shiitakes grew out of them. And so the reason I bring that up is I look at this center slide and I'm wondering if that's how those mushrooms grew. Um, and then to the left, uh, as a chef, uh, the French know these as the diamonds of the kitchen, uh, the truffles. Uh, on the left, you've got the burgundy truffles. And then on the right, you've got uh, Himalayan truffles. Um, and the ones on the left, they call them burgundy truffles, my guess is because of the color. Maybe you can't tell from the picture, uh, but it does say there in small print product of Italy. And on the right, uh, uh, it says tuber indicum. So I'm uh, guessing, assuming that those truly did come from uh, Himalaya. And then the, this bottom slide here is all the different kind of dried mushrooms they had on the shelf there. Uh, and then uh, this is paradise for mice and men. This cheese display was just phenomenal, uh, fantastic. Two of my favorite cheeses in the world are Huntsman in uh, Port Salou, and then of course Bel Paez finishes a pretty uh, close third, and all three of those were there. So I had to take a picture of it. It's not the best picture, uh, but this display was just uh, outstanding. If you, I, I can't say it enough, if you ever get to San Francisco, go to this place. Uh, this is the inside of this, uh, the ferry building. On the top right, you've got a uh, pastry shop, a uh, produce stand. Uh, then the top left, uh, breads, breads, breads. This bread shop probably had, I want to say, 75 different varieties of breads that were baked that day. You can see all the different signs on them. And then, of course, uh, uh, the meat counter underneath there. Uh, this is San Francisco's version of a food truck. Um, this thing was on wheels. Uh, there were three of these rotisseries on this vehicle here. On the top, you've got uh, rotisserie chicken. Uh, the uh, whole pork loins that are tied, you can see are trussed. And then uh, more pork loins underneath, and then the bottom, the potatoes. And then my comment there, the potatoes on the bottom were nearly the best part because you know, they were, as they turned, the juices dripped down on those potatoes, and it was just incredible. Um, then this, uh, on the right there, I thought that was Belgium, uh, red Belgium endive, but they uh, told me that it was uh, radicchio, uh, finger radicchio is what the, uh, the farmer called it there. Um, and that caught my eye, and then of course the tablecloth with the color, I don't know, I'm a color guy, so that, that kind of caught me, so I, I took a picture of that. And then this special board I thought was really uh, interesting. The, the, the laser on this thing works on the wall, but not on the screen. But anyway, the, uh, the second one there, the beef, bacon, cheddar, cheeseburger, sausage. That caught my eye. I said, I gotta have about five of those. <laughs> and the, 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 the description says, yep, a beef handmade link packed with pieces of bacon and melty shredded cheddar, uh, griddled topped with crunchy lettuce and secret sauce on an Acme roll, eight bucks. 
uh, an Acme roll. That's, that was one of the companies that was there selling their breads. But anyway, um, I just thought the special sign was unique. And then at the bottom, uh, the Frank Roni Deluxe is a Gruyere, a Gruyere mac and cheese studded with uh, pieces of bacon and our hot dog, all breaded and deep fried. So if you're, if you're in for a, a cholesterol overload and a heart attack, have a couple of those. But anyway, uh, these were uh, vendors that literally had six or eight foot tables under tents uh, set, set outside on the streets, outside the, uh, outside the market. And uh, San Francisco is one of my favorite cities in the world, but just to see all these tables and all these people like us, foodie people there, um, and non-foodie people, they're completely enjoying the, uh, the guy that was just playing on the corner on the guitar and all this great food was, was phenomenal. It was really, uh, really something everybody as a chef or culinarian should enjoy. And then, of course, I'm a, I'm a dessert guy. Um, I don't know if you are familiar with uh, Connellais, but on the left, it's uh, pronounced Connellais. This is from the uh, Muller Lardon Cafe which was uh, literally uh, just like this room, uh, table set up, not staged like this, or stadium, whatever. Uh, but the kitchen was literally wide open, uh, probably seating for 30 or 40 people, and you were right there in the kitchen. And this was in this uh, ferry building in San Francisco. And that's where these Connellais were um, sold in, uh, in the market. And I know that there's a, a uh, pastry shop in Portland that makes, I think, four dozen of these a day, and people literally wait outside the door, and they're gone within a half hour. Um, probably not as good as Voodoo Donuts, but anyway, um, I'm a Voodoo Donut guy. Uh, but anyway, those are the Connellais on the left, and then on the right, this is a chamomile pound cake with black curry. Um, and when I, this is from uh, Les Elements de Patisserie in uh, San Francisco, a bakery there. When I went up to this table, um, this was one of the tables that was outside. When I went up to the table and I asked the lady for a piece of this, she says, well, where do you want it from? And I'm looking at this thing, and I'm looking at all that curry, and I'm thinking, you know what? I want an end piece because I want as much of that curry as I wanted, and that's what I told her. And she's like, good choice. So she gave me two pieces for the price of one. But anyway, this was, that was phenomenal also. And then here we go, uh, a little honesty going on. The sales lady at the counter said, told me these were good meaning the Connellais. So the picture on the right, she was right. I went back and got another one. <laughs> you see the bite out of it. I uh, scarfed down two of those and two pieces of this uh, uh, chamomile. It was uh, with that black curry around it. It was, uh, it was truly incredible. That was an experience I'll never forget going to the ferry market. But let's, let's move right into, into Germany here. Uh, this was day one of my trip. And this, this picture here is taken outside my hotel room window. Uh, and it gives, at least it gave me, this is the third time I've attended this event, it gave me a completely, uh, uh, a complete view of the difference in culture and architecture, and uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is if we're to, when I go to Portland and I take a picture out of my hotel room in Portland, it looks nothing like this, is really what I'm trying to say. Europe is different. Um, and in the center of the picture in the sky there, can can you see those spires there? Uh, uh, I'm sorry that the, the laser thing isn't working on the screen. But those spires there, that's a, a church. And this um, city in Erfurt, that's what, it's, um, what it uses on all its tourist information and all this stuff. They're just, uh, this church is stunning. It truly is. And I, I apologize for not getting a closer picture of it, but you can see how they stick out in the skyline there. Isn't it interesting that I guess a, a town in Europe would have, this, have a church be a part of their skyline, and here in the United States it might be like a, a bank building or something. But anyway, and I'm not a religious guy, but anyway, it was just kind of interest me, interesting to me what's uh, truly important there. Okay, now here's some more honesty. In Europe, when you, when you stay in a hotel, um, they feed you breakfast. And believe you me, look, there's three plates there, and they were all mine. <laughs> I ate all three plates of this food. And then that, that top plate, about 11 o'clock to the right, that glass bottle you see there, no, it's not wine. That's a, that's a bottle of water. And then, of course, coffee there uh, around 4 o'clock. 
But the, uh, the top plate there is fruit and what they call muesli. And then uh, uh, something very similar to cottage cheese that they call yogurt over there. Um, but anyway, that's what that top plate is. And then to the left, uh, it gets a little more interesting. Uh, a house croissant, uh, house preserves, uh, that kind of stuff. And then on the bottom of that plate to the left, uh, you see like two white squares and something looks like it might be smoked and then something on top of that that looks kind of purple. Well, what that is is that's three different kinds of herring, okay? So I, <laughs> I had uh, uh, red wine uh, herring, smoked herring, and then you see I have two, two pieces of the regular herring. Um, I grew up on herring, that's uh, my favorite, and those white things on top of that are, are onions. And then I don't know if you can see below, it looks like, like a, a rice crispy square there below there, that's charcuterie. Uh, three or four different slices of, of different charcuterie that they eat uh, for breakfast. They're very, very common. And then we get down to the center plate there. You got some, uh, of course, sausages, big in Germany. Um, the eggs there don't really do uh, justification uh, to the eye here as to how they were truly cooked. They're a lot looser there. Their eggs are probably medium rare, and we cook ours almost all the way to their, well, to their com almost completely firm. But anyway, this was at the S SAS Hotel. That was my breakfast the first day. I just wanted to impress you guys with how much I could eat. <laughs> but truly, it was, uh, it was a compliment to, the, um, uh, to what the hotel does there in their breakfast presentation. So this is the junior team Norway. Um, as I said, we'd be seeing uh, very unique, different vessels that food was served on. Um, this, I'm guessing, was served on black granite or whatever that uh, medium is there to emphasize the, the color of the cured salmon and uh, all the other different colors they've got on that plate. The other thing that I wanted to, to mention also is to the left there, um, I've got unique medium for description. Normally, in a culinary salon, uh, you use a piece of paper or a thick cardboard or something like that. Well, uh, the Scandian, Scandinavian countries see it completely different than I do um, as American. Maybe I, I believe it's because of our culture. Um, they think outside the box, beyond the box. I mean, who would think? Of, of having their, the description of this plate put on granite like that, and let alone the expense to do it, and let alone trusting the guy that's doing it to get the description right and spell it all right. But as you can see there, um, the judges really enjoy this because you've got two different dialects there. You've got English on the top and then you've got German on the bottom, which were the two uh, predominant languages over there. Uh, in the Culinary Olympics. This is, again, the junior team from Norway. Uh, cured salmon with scallops, apple and dill, uh, pickled gherkins and radishes, uh, green asparagus, an egg yolk emulsion and horseradish, uh, crisp fry, and dill infused oil with apples. So if you look at that kind of spindly thing there in the, in the center of the plate on that white there, which is the horseradish, that's the crisp fry. So when I think of crisp fry, I don't Mentally, I don't think of it like that, you know? Crisp rye, what, a cracker or, I don't know, a burnt piece of toast? I don't know. But anyway, they, they look at things a lot different than we do. Um, and then this I thought was interesting too. Um, it's kind of hard to read, so if you'll bear with me, I'll, I'll read it out loud. The, uh, I thought this was a nice touch by the junior team of Norway, kind of a, like a mission statement. It says, one team, one dream. The Norwegian culinary team ensures that the land of the north keeps its proud culinary tradition. And believe you me, they are proud of their tradition. They always finish in the top five. Norway has done well internationally, both as a team and on an individual basis. Hopefully some of these young chefs can eventually take the step up to the senior team and do well in the years to come. Getting the experience from competitions is important so you can carry the senior team. Um, it's also important so that we learn. That's what competitions are about. Um, it took me a lot, of, doing a lot of them. It's not to win. Of course it's to win. But really, truly, the underlying theme is it's educational experience. 
Um, we see ourselves as recruitment base for the senior team and so on and so forth. So this is their um, mission statement, which I didn't see any other junior team have. And of course, again, on granite and all this stuff, I just thought it was uh, a nice touch. And then we get into some uh, pictures of food. And what I'm gonna do here is bring up some trends that I've n I noticed at the Olympics this time around. Um, this is, in my, uh, in my world, some incredible craftsmanship here. This is uh, veal tenderloin Emmental. Does anybody know what Emmental is or Emmental? Um, in America, it's also known as Swiss cheese, okay? Um, with bread and a cork crust and caramel jus. Does anybody know what cork is? And these are not, I'm not quizzing you like you should know these. I'm just curious if you've ever heard this. A uh, quark is also, uh, it's sour milk uh, denatured, cooked to the point where the proteins come out of, it, out of it and forms a solid. That's what quark is. And caramel jus, uh, potato and chestnut sliced chanterelles, mountain cranberries, glazed salsify, and stewed Savoy cabbage. Um, now the trend here uh, that I wanted to talk about is if you, do you see that piece on the top left there? It's almost like an L shape. This, this trend I saw throughout the Olympics in uh, the pâtés and the terrines. It's the modern uh, shape now for terrines. So keep that in mind as, as we move along. Um, and then I thought it was interesting if in, any of us uh, or any of you folks get into culinary competitions, it's very important to have a clean description card. That's what the judges are looking for, right to the point. Uh, then this was really uh, innovative uh, to me from the Korean national team. Again, a clean identical description. This is a snail terrine with pea mousse and spaghetti. A sweet potato salad with basil, pecan nut, and red wine essence. Now, if you look at that transparent uh, piece of architecture that's leaning on that uh, snail terrine, that is a snow pea with a piece of spaghetti in the center of it. Um, how they did that, I haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> but what I do know is this gives us an insight as to how intense and how, what unbelievable lengths chefs will go to do, go to, to do well in competition. But I thought this was uh, very unique. I would never think of doing a snail terrine. Now I am familiar that, uh, uh, peas go with snails and pecans and red wine go with snails. I didn't know that a uh, uh, sweet potato salad, I didn't know sweet potatoes went with snails. But anyway, that was uh, one of the category B hot plates for the uh, Korean national team. Now we get into the USA, uh, ACF, American Culinary Federation, uh, sponsored this regional team. Uh, the thing I really like about this plate is the, the dough emulates the body of a fish and acts as starch with the ravioli. That orange disc that you see two-thirds of the way towards the tail of that fish is a butternut squash ravioli, is what that is. And then behind that, you've got creamed leeks and fennel. So the description reads, poached steelhead trout, if I said salmon, excuse me, a watercress mousseline, so the green and the, the pink medallions, there's your watercress mousse. Then I mentioned the creamy fennel and leek. Um, I said butternut squash. It's a pumpkin ravioli, uh, sautéed zucchini, and then a buttermilk potato cracker. When I think of a cracker, I don't think of a head and the tail of a fish, do you guys? I think of a cracker as a, a Waverly wafer, you know what I mean? But this is another example uh, when you get into the competition arena, how you need to think outside the box, how we need to think outside the box. Uh, then moving right along, uh, I thought this was nice, uh, the suckling pig. Uh, this, they took a, a suckling pig, and what they called this a sampling of heritage suckling pig, a cured tenderloin with ham and scallion farce. So the two medallions, you see the snout of the pig there, you see how they, they use the butternut squash to outline the pig's body, which I thought was very unique. So the two medallions by the snout of the pig are the, uh, the tenderloin with the ham and scallion, 
Then the barbecued rib terrine with collard greens is above that, that little uh, curved piece there. Uh, and then the stuffed cabbage on the back with uh, potato puree, butternut squash, and then country style chow chow relish. Now, chow chow, if you get, do you guys know what chow chow is? Stan, what's chow chow? There you go. And what, do we serve chow chow at Broken Top? Yeah, we do out the lake houses with the condiments on our hot dogs. So I, I immediately thought of Stan because he implemented that out the lake house when I was in Germany. They have chow chow on pork. That made me think Stan knows his business. He's putting chow chow with pork. USA ACF regional team is putting chow chow with pork. There's one of the reason I'm uh, bringing that up so specifically is in again in the competition arena you have to serve things that go with things. I uh, at a tableside competition in Nashville, Tennessee I was working at Illy Hills in uh, in the valley and went down to the uh, ACF National and qualified to be one of the final eight for this uh, tableside cooking competition. So what I do? Um, I'm going to do salmon. I'm going to do hazelnuts. I'm going to do berries. I'm going to do Northwest stuff. So I did that. Um, I finished in the top three. The, one of the judges pulled me aside and said, berries don't go with salmon. So that's why you didn't win. But anyway, I, was, I wasn't sore about that at all. <laughs> but here, you know, here berries go with salmon quite frequently. But anyway, um, this was the, uh, the pork uh, entry there. And then I wanted to get into uh, vegetarian. Um, this top left here, that orange you see on the plate, that's carrot, which would make sense. But they called it carrot leather. So what they did is they took a, a slice of the carrot they cut it on the bias, then cut it down here, then they rolled up some, uh, uh, what is that in there? That's uh, cheese of some sort, I, I do believe. Um, but they put this carrot in the dehydrator to make what they call carrot leather. Um, so another, another way of thinking outside the box for uh, culinary competitions. Um, so what this is, they call this a mixed bean terrine, which is your main piece in the center. Uh, pickled vegetables, which you see on the top right and also to the left. Uh, spiced carrot leather, the center of the plate. Uh, red pepper coulis, pretty easily identif identifiable. Uh, uh, balsamic pearls and crispy eggplant chips. So there again, you've got some crunch in with your dish and you've got this smooth, um, what they call that, uh, mixed bean terrine. Yeah, mixed bean terrine is smooth. Um, and then the, the black on the right side of that mixed bean terrine are the balsamic pearls. So that's when uh, you get into the molecular gastronomy. Um, it wasn't a big part of the Olympics here because, well, in my opinion, it wasn't a big part of the Olympics because the chefs knew that's not what the judges were looking for. They wanted to see some of the uh, uh, expertise and technique, so they did. the USA team did just a, just a bit of it on the side there, and of course that would those flavors would match well. National Team Japan, now this was my favorite piece of the day and uh, maybe some of the chef instructors can give me some insight as to this, but I've yet to, well I think I figured out how to do this, I've yet to make it, I don't know, maybe I have, maybe I haven't. But you see this uh, teardrop here, it's called a smoked chicken uh, chauffeur, uh, chicken galantine with a cold consomme soup. Uh, in my humble opinion, what a phenomenal concept this was. Uh, chauffeur is a cold sauce set with gelatin cream added to it. The only thing I can figure is that they made the chauffeur, they laid it out on a sheet tray on a rack, um, then they smoked it. Then they let it set up again to where it was firm, and then they wrapped this teardrop uh, of chicken. So, I guess, well, the, let's start... Um, the little round dots you see in this teardrop in the center, I could not figure out what those were. This was another trend that was going on at the Olympics almost, well, on quite a few of the tables. That is the tiniest of tiniest asparagus you can ever imagine. That's what those dots are around the outside of this uh, inlay is what that's called. So you've got your, your, your farce inlay wrapped in these uh, with asparagus and then you've got red pepper it looks like herbs around there that form this teardrop and then you see the solid white 
around all of that. That's the show flaw. So what I'm saying is I think they took a sheet tray with a rack on it. Excuse me. They took a sheet tray, poured their shelf wall out, let it sit. Then they turned it out onto a rack, put it in the smoker just till it was slightly smoked, and got those rack type look around the outside of it, and then let it set up again, and then wrapped it around this, this teardrop. It just blew me away. I'd never seen anything like that um, in a competition. And then to top it all off, um, served with a cold consomme. Um, and I don't know if you're familiar with the difference between a galantine and the ballantine. A galantine is wrapped and served cold, a ballantine is wrapped and served warm. That's the difference. That's why they could uh, uh, get away uh, with calling this uh, a galantine because it was served cold and then with the, the cold consomme. And then I thought this was a, a nice picture. Notice how the different level shapes and vessels and cleanliness are attractive to the eye. Um, at first glance, this might look a little, a little busy because you've got a round, a rectangle, you've got some, I don't know, crazy square shapes, all that stuff there. And then you've got all these uh, uh, podiums underneath it. But really, once it settles into the eye, and especially if you're standing in front of this table, this table looks so clean and so, uh, so precise, it was just very, very, very impressive. And I couldn't get a, a better picture of it because you can see the guy to the left. There are about 50 guys to the left around this table. Uh, there are chefs taking pictures like crazy for ideas. But anyway, I just, um, <clears throat> excuse me, as you'll notice at the top it says National Team Japan. This is a national table. So the national teams are allowed a lot more room than, you, than the junior teams and the individual competitors. Oh boy. Now we get to the really good part. So that was the cold food part of the day. And now we move into what I had for dinner. Um, this, uh, the description is another trend that I continued to see throughout my trip to Erfurt there. Lobster globe. Everything is a globe. Everything. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I, I, I guess I mean it in a way that I saw a lot of it there. Um, we had sauces and globes, we had desserts and globes, we had lobster and globes. Um, instead of uh, last time there, I think they called it a sphere. Uh, maybe one, at one time they called it a, a ball. I don't, I don't know, but now it's known as a globe. Um, so anyway, this lobster tail from, uh, from Team, Can Team Canada was just phenomenal. What they did is they, they took the lobster and stuffed it with a scallop. So they took cheesecloth, butterflied the lobster so it would lay kind of flat, put a scallop in there, wrap the cheesecloth around it, and then poached it in court bouillon. So that's how they got the globe shape. Um, uh, uh, more trends, and maybe uh, you folks that are on uh, YouTube and are looking on the internet, and especially in the European uh, plating techniques, techniques, slice radishes. Um, that's another trend I wanted to bring up. So you got a sliced radish there. You can't see it. There's, uh, you can't see them, but there's some borage flowers maybe behind the lobster. Uh, mango puree. You can see some of the row from the lobster and the mango puree and the seaweed chip. Uh, the row is important in this picture because that shows the judges complete utilization of product. Uh, this was in what they call the restaurant of nations. So you walked into this huge auditorium where they were, were set for anywhere from 770 to 990 people. Um, they were anywhere from seven glass kitchens, probably about this size, to nine. And what you had in those glass kitchens were seven to nine different countries cooking and competing. This is category K, or some people uh, in Sweden in particular call it uh, category R. I don't know why, maybe R for restaurant. K for kitchen, as the Americans know it. But anyway, the, uh, the best part about this was you sat down at tables of 10, or excuse me, you can see my ticket above the, the plate there, okay? You sat down at tables of 10, so uh, I met up with a guy from St. Augustine, Florida, who I've known for over 25 years, L. Edwin Brown, maybe you ACF guys know him. 
Uh, but anyway, uh, there's two people. Then you got eight more seats. You got eight more people sitting at this table. Well, you could have up to 10 different countries sitting at one table. The plate served at the table could be anywhere up to uh, seven to nine different three course dinners. So <laughs> it, was, it was unique because the cultural exchange of what was on the plate, the people sitting at the table, and then the language barrier. It was really phenomenal. Uh, I wanna say at, at any given time, uh, there were people at my table that smoke, uh, excuse me, spoke uh, French, uh, Flemish, uh, Korean, or some kind of a Asian dialect, English, um, and then just imagine 28 other countries. But literally four or five different languages being spoke at these tables. And we don't know, like I don't know you guys from Adam, but what happened at these tables, these plates were passed around from person to person. Of course, everybody had to get a picture of, of the difference. So you could get up to 30 different ideas because uh, there are three course dinners, 10 people at the, at the table, and they, they pass around. Um, we pass around the plates. But anyway, this was the first course of the first evening that I had. This was Team Canada. This was a phenomenal uh, gastronomic experience for me. Second course, another one of my favorite things, lamb loin. Lamb loin, lamb shoulder, baby golden, and orange carrots, chanterelles, and lamb jus. Chanterelles, well, we served that to you. First course here, another one of my favorite things. Um, this was very, very good. The thing that mystified me here, and I, and I think I figured it out, was you see those uh, orange and uh, gold carrots there, or yellow carrots or whatever, your, however your eye perceives them? Those were stuck together. How'd they do that? So what they, they did is they took baby carrots of those colors, they bundled them all together. Before they bundled them all together in uh, Decatur, Illinois, where I worked, there's a company named Archer Daniels Midland who is known for soybeans and creating starches out of soybeans. And also Staley Manufacturing, who's based in uh, England. And they do the same thing, they work hand in hand. And they create these aerosols, almost, uh, well, like a hairspray can. Not that they sprayed hairspray on here, but these high concentrated starches that are so high in, in sugar, in, in uh, and proteins and a mixture of this and a little bit of this and a little bit of that in these cans that they sprayed on these vegetables that stuck them together and they stuck together when they cooked them. Yes? Does that take the flavor of the carrots? Not at all. It didn't take any flavor. Actually, um, because it was made from starch, sweetener, uh, corn syrup, or these two companies' specialties, it actually made them a little sweeter. And I'm not sure that they got that from those companies but that's my thought. It's just like um, if you'd make a terrine, you'd spray it with this and you'd wrap it with a force meat, it'd stick right to it. So that was the, the center of the plate, the entree, and then on the bottom, oh boy, they, they hit a home run with this one with the judges. Uh, simple lemon sponge cake with lemon ice. You see that kind of earth colored uh, tube on top of the, uh, the center of the, the lemon uh, glazed sponge cake there, uh, that's what the lemon ice uh, was inside of, how they did that and kept it frozen um, is beyond me, but I know that Paulo figured it out for me. <laughs> uh, and then uh, on the plate there, you've got some uh, semi-fredo sorbet, uh, semi-frozen, some gooseberries there to the right, and then almost, in my opinion, the best part of this whole plate was that little uh, batonette of uh, rhubarb there. Just a phenomenal, um, idea for dessert. And then uh, sticking true to uh, my taste buds, that a little stick of chocolate. They just, just put a touch of chocolate in there. I love chocolate. But anyway, um, so they did lobster, lamb, and lemon. Uh, the Canadian team did. This is video of Team, team Canada in action. You see the clock there? Does it say like 6.30? I think they're like nine hours ahead of us.
So you can see the different flags there. Those are all the countries represented at the Olympics. And kind of that shot of the ceiling gives you an idea of how the magnitude of this uh, competition. But you know what the biggest thing that stuck out to me in that video? And the reason that this is the reason I quit recording it? Nothing. These guys weren't scurrying around. They weren't excited. They weren't disorganized. They weren't, sauces weren't flying in the air. I mean, they, they had their, their stuff together. I mean, they were uh, a cohesive team. And as soon as this dinner was over and we're walking back out of the messe to the tram to go back to the hotel, I said to L. Edwin, I said, that's got to be a gold medal. And um, because I'm so smart, they did. They got it. Not really. But really, I just knew that that was gold medal work because um, when you're in the, the hot food kitchen in the restaurant of nations, you're not only judged on the, uh, the flavor of your food, the texture, the aroma, the technique, all that stuff. You're based on your expediency. You're based on uh, how you conduct yourself. Of course, sanitation, all that stuff comes, comes into play. But when we looked at that video, we didn't see any mayhem or chaos. And I was, I don't want to say I was hoping to, but I was just so surprised how calm they were. You could tell that they'd practiced this a thousand times. But anyway, that was um, the first day of the competition. And what we want to do now is uh, have you folks come on up and uh, get one of these scallops. And so they, they sat for a little bit. We've, this is, uh, these are um, katafi crusted scallops. Um, and the best way I can describe the katafi on these to people that haven't seen them before, it's me on a bad hair day. This is kind of how my hair looks if I'm having a bad hair day. But anyway, um, katafi is a shredded phyllo. Maybe you're familiar with it, maybe you're not. It's uh, traditionally used in uh, sweet applications. But because we, we like to think outside the box, we use it in a savory one. And this has truly become our, uh, our signature dish up there at Broken Top. And where this developed, I learned this uh, from a French chef in uh, Santa Barbara, California, at a restaurant called Citron, which has since closed. But he used uh, katafi on his strudels and, and all of his, uh, uh, excuse me, a lot of his dessert applications. So when I, I worked in Boca Raton, Florida, I made a lobster galantine for the gala dinner, and I thought, hmm, maybe I'll wrap that in the katafi and see how it, how it works, and it did, and it was a success. So when we think of scallops, a lot of people think of fried scallops. This is about as close as we'll get to fried scallops at Broken Top. But if, uh, if you folks want to come up and grab one, there's forks and napkins there. Underneath it is uh, uh, lobster sauce. And then on top, there's micro arugula tossing a little bit of truffle oil. <laughs>